It's another Moss Football Friday, and we've reached where the leaves fall off and they turn orange and brown, depending on where you're at. I mean, where I'm at, everything is brown, but it is what it is. And look, it's all three of us. It's a Moss Football Friday. TJ, Vegas, Mac, we've had a couple of weeks. A week off last week. There's a lot of shiz going on, if you will. Mac, how the hell are you, buddy? Doing well, guys. Good to see you. Uh, enjoyed a little bit of a break, but... Uh... Man, yeah, let's let's get into it. Let's go. TJ, we had all kinds of stuff last weekend. We started with the big battle in Vegas with Boise and Nevada. I mean, where where do we go from here before we get into some bad beat kind of stuff? How are you, sir? <laughs> oh, I'm ready to I'm ready for some bad beats and some, but I'd really much prefer some good beats because yeah. the bad beats are getting to my wallet and I don't appreciate that. Yeah, exactly. You know, we'll start with, I got to tell this story because both of you guys got my wrath through this. Uh, you guys both laid off of the Minnesota and LA Rams game a week ago. Obviously, we saw the Jets and the Texans last night, but a week ago, Minnesota and the Rams. I've got this, and I'll admit, we've talked about this on the show. I've got this crack card bet that has the Rams plus three and a half, under 48, you know, or 48, yeah, under 48, mm -hmm. under 48 and a half, to be fair. And then I had a bunch of other, like, low-level, I watered it down stuff. About 250 bucks, you know? Good for a weekend of beers, maybe pay your water bill. And, my God, can we call an effing face mask <laughs> with two friggin' people watching? Like, you can't get a worse bad beat than that. I know crack cards, we talk about them all the time. They're crack cards for a reason. But, TJ, mm -hmm. you and I have dealt with this together in casinos in Vegas a couple of times that I think one time one of us was asked to please sit down over the loudspeaker. But, mm -hmm. like, dude, it's fun. That and we talked about the fun of losing a bet a couple of weeks ago. This one was fun to ride, but not as fun to lose, man. <laughs> no, that's a brutal, brutal beat right there, especially with with how it ended. You don't want to uh, we're, we're all going to take bad beats. That's just a fact of life. We're going to do it. But that way, in with something that appeared so egregious and just like that had no, there was no excuse for it to happen. Was that was rough. Just, he was over here and the, <laughs> the hand was here. Even the defender. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Who I'm, I, I think it was. Wasn't it Jared Verse? Yeah, he, he was, was like, oh, my he was gosh, like what, oh no, what did I, I did do? it. I, what did I do? <laughs> Dude, Mac, yeah. this is insane. It's like, so bad. you had the I, week off, you know. So, TJ and I were working out the working out the uh, group text, if you will. But like, I don't get mad anymore when I lose a bet. You know what the risk is, and we've talked about. We've all done videos on this on our channels at Mike Arana Show across every social channel. Other than Snapchat. Snap, you don't do a whole lot for us. We're on threads now, by the way. Follow us on threads. But, like, my God, like, here and two guys, two guys staring at it from two different angles and a defender. Like, Mac, I know you and I have talked about this, the replay system. Can we not have replay assist there to go? Yeah, Mr. Tolbert, um, you're blind as fuck. You're like, seriously. <laughs> I, I, I know. I mean, it seems like we have replay for everything else. And it's like, I mean, if you're going to have replay, let's just have replay. Let's not have any sort of these weird rules like, well, we can only use it for this or we can only use it for that. I mean, I one of the things I asked you, because I was a little confused, I'm like, it was a scoring play. So they review right. all the scoring plays. But it's like, oh, well, we can't, you know, it just doesn't make sense. If you're going to use replay, use replay. I mean, that that's that's the bottom line. And something like that, I mean, that changed the game. That's the whole reason replay came in, right? It, it's it's because of that playoff game, you know, with the Saints. Like, they, they needed to have a call be made. If you're going to have replay, have replay. I've tried to block that one out of my mind as I bang <laughs> my arm all over the place here. But, yeah, that game exactly. And it's like, and I've liked it this year, and we've all talked about this, but I've liked it this year because we get the, hey, after replay assist, this was blah, blah, blah. You know, and we saw it even a couple of times on uh, Monday night with the Giants and Steelers. I like the fact that replay assist says, hey, yeah, nope, yeah, we're good. We don't need to waste time on this. 
but then stuff like that. And I get it. If you, if we open Pandora's box guys and TJ, I know you've had some thoughts on this a lot, but if we open Pandora's box to where we can replay everything, then we're talking about the NFL has a major league baseball problem where the games are taking too long. But I'm like, here's my thought. Last two minutes, anything is reviewable by replay assist. And granted, all the Vikings fans were like, that should have been a face mat. You still had to go 97. That would have put you at the 20 with about a buck 40. Don't quote me. It was a week ago, over a week ago. But about a buck 40, and you had to go and score, and you had to get two. So we're not saying that the game was... Oh, yep, this is why the Vikings lost. And we, on this show, will never say that a referee or an umpire or whatever is a reason somebody lost. But give me an inside two-minute thing, Teach. Like, hey, inside two minutes. Now, you know what? Dude, everybody in America saw that. If we don't change this, we all look like assholes, which is what they did. Yeah, but then you get into, if it's going to be, in, like you said, if it's going to be inside two minutes, then why isn't it the whole game? And yeah. yeah, we all we 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 seem to have this unwritten rule of well, the last two minutes or the last five minutes, you, this is called differently than the first fifty minutes. And right. now, what are you doing? You might as well just throw the rule book out and and play it however you want to. Um, look, I'm I'm with you. If you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. If you're going to replay things, replay things. If you're not, go back to how it used to be and don't, don't do replay. And that's fine with me because then at least I can expect that that officials are going to miss calls and I have to acknowledge that they're going to miss calls. And that's just part of the game. Can we, if there's no, if there's no, if there's no apparatus to correct that, then it's just becomes accepted part of the game. Can we have it like baseball? I mean, in baseball, in essence, every play is reviewable. You see them all the time. They show them in the dugout. You have the coaches on the phone, the head coaches, look, the managers looking back and they're like, no, no, go ahead. Or yeah, let's, let's go ahead and review it. I mean, can we, I mean, everything is so quick right now. We, we know they can get the replays done real quickly. You know, can we, can the football adopt a, a system like that? Say, Hey, listen, that's a play. Listen, we, we, we want to replay on that. You know, I don't see why it should be any different in football than it is in baseball. Now I want to see more coaches drop challenge flags. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> Jeff Ulbrich. I want to see coaches fumble challenge flags, but there is something to it. You're always going to be on this side or you're always going to be on this side. We've got to find the middle ground and like teach your response. Like, yeah, inside two minutes, why aren't we doing it the whole game? Robot umpires, all that nonsense. Like I swear to God, if I see a robot umpire, I'll never watch another baseball game again. I know there's been Angel Hernandez for most of my life and Joe West, big country. Like I get that part, but let's, also, like, let's keep it in reason. And really, before sports gambling became what it was, I don't really remember a whole lot of people losing their ever-loving ass over, you know, hey, that was a bad call. Like, oh, we lost the game because the, it, the my favorite are the people. And I think we all agree on this, Teach. Like, my favorite are the people that go, oh, we lost that game because the refs were against us. Bro, mm -hmm. you lost that game because you sucked. Let's let's call yeah. a spade a spade. You, you lost the game because you were two for sixteen on third down, not because <laughs> exactly. the refs blew the call in. You missed nine yeah. free throws. That's why you lost the game. Exactly. So exactly, that's a never-ending debate. But we're going to keep moving along. Here is we've had a lot of stuff in the college football world. We're getting into it's November first, boys. We're into it now, and on Tuesday. Just a few days away, minds will be blown and everybody across the country is going to be paying attention to what happens in January because the first college football playoff rankings come out and we've got some stuff here. We've got some disrespected teams. Obviously, we all have our feelings about certain things. Fraud alert in, uh, what is that, college park? I don't care where it is. Fraud alert where James Franklin is. Ohio State, Penn State, which is conveniently being played at 9 in the morning on the West Coast because that makes a hell of a lot of sense. We've got all kinds of stuff going on, and I can't wait for Tuesday 
to see who our 12 are in and who maybe one or two out. And I think the one team we could probably start with, at least from my standpoint, when it comes to the college football playoff brackets and what we think we're going to see is the disrespect to Coach Sig and the Indiana Hoosiers. That's a damn good football team. And we know, we've all talked about this, the realignment, the shuffling, the imbalanced conference schedules. Not everybody's going to play anybody, everybody. You've got a situation in, and I'll use the Big Ten for an example. It's highly unlikely. But there is a situation where there could be a three-way tie at the top of the Big Ten. And Oregon, the number one team in the country, could miss out on the Big Ten championship game. Does Dan Lanning give a shit? No, he doesn't because it's an extra bye week. Oregon's the number one team in the country, but that's the kind of stuff we got going on. I don't understand the disrespect for Indiana, but when I look at this, I'm hoping one more week we start to come to our senses, Mac, that Indiana is in the mix and they should be in the college football playoff, whether they are first, second, or even third in the Big Ten. Absolutely. And last week was really, really impressive. They did it without their starting quarterback. So everybody, you know, you had to say, okay, let's see what this Indiana team can do now without their starting quarterback. It didn't matter. It did not matter at all. This is a team. It's as well balanced a team that I, I've seen in a long time. I mean, they're they're not Oregon. We we know that. But listen, they run the ball well, they they throw the ball well, they don't commit a lot of turnovers, they don't do they don't penalize themselves very much. They put themselves in good spots. They play good defense. They're, you can tell they're well coached at every aspect of the game. This is a complete team, an absolute complete team. They are fun to watch. And now they get their starting quarterback back. I mean, that this, is, this just goes to show you how deep this team is. Uh, I've been nothing but impressed. Uh, the last couple of weeks with this team. And, and again, they're, they're doing exactly what they need to do. They're not only winning, they're winning comfortably every single week. Yeah, no doubt about it. And TJ, I know like you and me on the over under side, we, we fight a lot of battles on Saturdays. What's the most out of the box thing you're seeing so far with where everybody is, you know, who our cash cows are, because we've been on the same page a lot of the time, but where are you leaning to? I'm not sure how this team's going to go. Oh, well, for me, it's always it for, the, and you could say this probably for the last few years, it's been Penn state. It, it, I have no idea what Penn state team's going to show up every week. Neither does James Franklin. Hell. Oh yeah. Well, we know what, we know what Penn state team will show up. If there's a little number by their opponent, we know which one will show up. But Penn State has got to be the most frustrating team to bet over the last several several years, just because they're so wildly inconsistent. Like they have a great big team right now, and they could come out next week and just crap the bed, and everybody just be like, "Yep, yeah, it's Penn State." You know, they do that, and like, well, no, they're not supposed to do that. If they were a great team, like like everybody says, and if they were a championship contender, like everybody says, they wouldn't do that. No, I, I a thousand percent agree with you. And we're going to get maybe a little bit more in detail on this game later. But we brought up Penn State. We might as well bring up Ohio State. And we give James Franklin a lot of crap because, honestly, he deserves it. Ryan Day hasn't beaten a top five opponent since September 3rd of 2022. That's four straight losses. Franklin hasn't beaten a top five opponent since October of 2016. He's lost 10 straight. What gives? We'll get to that, but that's where we're at with everything is. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the product, and all of us had our feelings on realignment. Personally, I don't hate it. Like, I love the, hey, Oregon needs to get ready for Big Ten football. Newsflash, Big Ten. You guys need to get ready for Oregon football. I mean, but what we have is we have these massive conferences where not everybody's playing each other. SEC, for example. There is a legitimate scenario where we've got six or seven SEC teams with two losses in the conference. The ACC, I think, has actually been kind of fun to watch. It started out really crappy, but it's gotten fun to watch because of who's playing right now. Everybody except for Pitt. 
if Cal's kicker could have hit the broad side of a barn from the hay bales in the middle of like the, the country with cows and horses around, we're not talking about Pitt. Mac, you, I know hey, we're going to talk about, okay, but we so are, put, but we are, I'm going to put you on the carpet then who's a better football team, Penn state or Pitt. Oh, oh crickets. Like James Franklin's oh head during a top five oh match. I don't even, I don't even, uh, oh you want to say Pitt. That's the thing. I do. I do want to say Pitt. I really do. I I think they're I think they're more explosive offensively than Penn State. I think they would beat them. <laughs> Why don't they play anyway? That's a, how come they're not playing? That, that that's that's a rivalry. That that, that game should happen well, every year. Dr. Pepper and Allstate, and then the Allegheny River. I'm sure there's some kind of tribunal that has to go around to make sure they all play every year but like mm. teach then you know this from the small conference side being a nevada grad and everything else and it's nevada not nevada not nevada like all that stuff mm. we can go into that for hours but like this is the thing is like you're used to seeing these matchups year in and year out and now that the big conferences said we want more we want more we want more and they're like hmm how do we figure all this out because our best teams aren't actually playing each other and we got to pick two and then hope for the rest we know what's yeah. going to happen <laughs> oh oh yeah we 100 know what's going to happen it's it's going to be whatever if, especially if you that three-way tie scenario that you speak of comes in play who's going to get it well it's going to be the teams that provide the biggest ratings and the biggest punch that's who's going to get it um it, look this is I think that my feelings on realignment, I've conveyed them offline that that I'm not a big fan. I think this is horrendous. Um, I like seeing some of the matchups, but I mean, this is what it's going this is what it leads to, right? So yeah, it's great that Oregon can play Ohio State and it counts as a conference game, but what does that sacrifice in the in the big picture? Um, it kind of takes away some of that sanctity if they were to meet, say, in the round of eight or the round of four, right? So um yeah, and it's very, and it's it's even more frustrating when, when the conferences abandon the division setup to go into these mega conferences. Like the division setup was important, right? Because at least at least it kind of had some sort of system and some sort of program where the the if I got a Big Ten East and a Big Ten West team or whatever it was, um, I think one time it was like the leaders and the somethings or whatever. Um, at least it kind of seemed like it was legitimate. The boring this, boringers. Yeah, this does not. This is just a grab bag, as far as I'm concerned. And then you're going to get to a situation where if they all finish up at the, you got a team like Indiana who might get hosed. Right. Exactly. And, and and before we get into our Friday night game here, I mean, let's just go around the horn here. Final word, kind of stuff. I like the realignment. I like the shifting, and we're going to say this. On November 1st, 2024, at 1.45 in the afternoon on the West Coast. We know what we know what's happening. We're going to a here's your legit division one, and here is your new division two. And it's how many NIL dollars do you have? How many NIL dollars do you have? And honestly, personally, Mac, I don't give a crap. Like, give me the blue bloods. Put the Big Ten and the SEC into the same damn conference. Split the Big 12 and the ACC. Put their higher-ups here. Put their lowers here. And let's move on with life. And I don't think any of us would have a problem with that. And go to a relegation model. That's like 10 times down the, down the road. But, like, TJ's on it. Like, by not having the divisional format, we're getting back to the – Ohio State Michigan winner beats the crap out of Iowa in the Big Ten championship every year. That's kind of where we're at this year. But with realignment, we're not. And that's what's exciting to me. But I'm the young head of this group, so change is always good for me. Like, cool, that's a fascinating idea until it's not. I mean, we also have I to left understand you that, you know, I did it. this is the first this for year. A year and a half. I left you speechless. How do we fix it? Because you're the one. You're the, you're the <laughs> yes. uniform guy. You're the this. You're the that. Like, 
are we in the right spot? Are we close? Are we farther but, away? Listen, if no, we're, we're not. Here's the thing, and, and I always go back to this: the one, the the FCS playoffs. Nobody ever complains about that. How come nobody complains oh. about those playoffs? Everybody seems. What were you shaking your head? Who complains? No, Nobody. I agree with you. It's done. I love right. watching that. Oh, they, they, so why can't we have a similar format? If nobody complains, that's what they don't understand. I mean, these, these lower divisions, I know, I know Dr. Pepper and everybody else. Exactly. But if you want it done right, then do it right. Okay. That, that, that's the thing. You know, have it, have a corporate championship after the season if you want. I don't really care, you know, but, but do it the right way. The, the young, the, these lower divisions, they do it the right way. You, they really do get a true champion. They, they have it figured out. I, I think what it comes down to, TJ, and we'll, we'll move on from this. I'll give you the last word on this one. But I think what it comes down to is we get to the point where it's like, God forbid, Boise State. Boise, not a state, comes in and they do a Statue of Liberty play and they beat good, big, broad Oklahoma. And they're afraid of that. Why? Because I still can tell you the exact minute, the exact spot I was when that happened. And it's almost like they're afraid to go, hey, yeah, you, you know what? It's the like, same thing baseball. This bullshit with baseball in the playoffs before this season. Like, oh, well, the teams that get the break, you know, they, they don't ever get out of the second round. So we might revisit this. Oh, by the way, now we got the Dodgers and Yankees World Series. Like, why are we afraid of it? What draws audiences? What I mean, don't ask the NBA. They have no clue right now. What draws audiences? You, We can all recall exactly where we were when Boise State beat Oklahoma. And we were all, who in the hell is Boise State? Why are we afraid of it is what I don't understand. Well, I, and you know what, you, there's a, there's a really max talking about the FCS model. You can, let's look at the, let's look at the basketball tournament. The basketball tournament does it the right way too. Right. And, and look at some of the teams that have been in, in the final four in the last few seasons, San Diego state played a nat for national championship, Florida Atlantic. Like who? Right. Like they the basketball basketball seems to have it figured out. Right. And we love that. We love it. But now f football does it. And I, I agree with you. Football d tries to do it. And it's like a, a gong show because we have all these ex all these factors that can that can go into it. Look, like I said, I'm not a fan of the realignment, but if you're going to be in for a penny, you're in for a pound. I think that's the second time I've said that. So you might want to start a counter. Um let's do it the right way. Mm. Let's do it the right way. And I think that's one of the advantages to how it was before realignment is because we could take 10 conference champions and throw it into this formula, or we could take eight conference champions and the next four, right? We could do something like that, or we could, or we could take eight conference champions and the next eight. I don't, look, <laughs> I don't care. We might as well just put it where it's going to be at 32, Exactly. But yeah. Let's do it. The, like you said, let's do it the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we move on, one of the teams we just mentioned, our Friday night game, no shade on anything else that's going on, but San Diego State, the Aztecs, who played in the College Basketball National Championship a couple of years ago, but their football team is nowhere close to that. They uh, travel to Boise State, the 17th ranked Broncos, 17th ranked Broncos. It's a very important number because as we go forward and we'll find out Tuesday night when all the votes are counted and everything's tabulated on Tuesday night, we'll know where we're at to go forward. But Boise State, 23 and a half point favorites over under at 57 and a half. This game is a five o'clock start a couple hours from now on FS1. And I we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I don't think any of us think this is going to be a game. The 23 and a half is a little egregious. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not betting the game. Ashton Genty, though, because as we talk about weekly with the Heisman, he had a ho-hum game last weekend. 
a lot of running backs in the NFL would wish for half of that whole home game. I'm not touching this game at all from a point standpoint. If I get a little froggy and I want some pizza money for Saturday, I'm going to go over. But in the over-under sense, TJ, at 57 and a half, I think Boise State's going to have to score 54 and a half of those 57 and a half. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and if, if when this game starts, this is what you're going to see. I'm just going to show you right now. This is what you're going to see. Because it's going to be the Ashton Genty show. This is all, all Boise State's going to do. It is going to be a Jerry Lewis run-a-thon. Um, and, but they, I still think they could get to that, that 50, 50 plateau. Like they just, Boise state is so good at running the football with Ashton Genty. That's not even a joke. And guess what? San Diego state is not great at doing stopping the run. This is going to be a blowout. I think that this is one of those things, Mike, where once again, I think we talked about this in the past. This is a play where I would take the first half bet on with Boise state. Mm -hmm. They get out to 17 point lead and then cruise. Yeah, and it, like you just said before, I switch it over to Mac here because I know Boise in Mac's house is a big deal, but it's also a game teach where we go live line hunting sometimes. Maybe you're not comfortable. We know Boise can put up 60. I don't know if San Diego State can put up three. Now, no knock on Sean Lewis. Like, I love the new stadium. I love everything that's happening to San Diego State, they're just not there yet, and that's fine. I don't know if Boise can score 60. And then at the flip side, from a betting standpoint, that's where you have to go, how many points do I think the team that's going to get their asses kicked is actually going to score? And then I know this team's good for that. That's live line hunting stuff that we've talked about. Now, Mac, when we look at this, and it's going to be very interesting – because I know you will be paying even more attention this weekend to the shakeout. It's statement weekend. And and people don't think that's a big deal, but it is. And the first team who's hovering in that first in, first out window, Boise State, gets the first chance to go, boom, there's statement before you play anything Saturday. And I don't think people count that in, Mac, like, it's statement weekend. We're going to see some stuff that we normally don't see this weekend. Yeah, well, Boise last week, I mean, they knew they were going to be in for a tough game. UNLV did a good job, you know, slowing down the run. What hurt Boise last week was on third down. They were three for 15 on third down. And they just were not converting. They, they actually struggled even a lot with their passing game. They, they couldn't get anything going at all last week. Gentry almost broke a couple of big runs in that first half. He got tripped up quite a bit. Didn't have, like you said, a great game. But listen, I, I think Boise rules in this game. I mean, San Diego State's not that good. Their only two wins this year are against uh, Hawaii and Wyoming. It's not like this is a juggernaut. I think Boise puts a big number on them. And, and TJ, I agree with you. I think it's going to be in the first half. I, I could see them uh, having 30, 40 points at halftime. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I see too. I see the, them just running away with this right from the beginning. And then it's, and then, and then we look at the stats after the game and I'm like Ashton Genty only had 180 yards. Well, it's because he's only going to play three quarters. That's why. Right. Yeah, Ashton Genty got sat, sat down with 10 minutes left in the second quarter. That mm -hmm. again, the case, exactly like you said, the case where, you know, numbers don't always tell the whole story. And when we look at this weekend being a statement weekend, guys, we've got, 10th ranked uh, Texas A&M at South Carolina. Ranked team against unranked team on the road. We continue that trend to Kansas State at 17 against Houston. Indiana, who we talked about earlier, at Michigan State. We've got Florida and Georgia on a neutral field. So that one doesn't totally fit the bill. Oregon, number one at the big house, because that's going to be such a game. Uh, we'll get to that one in a second. And then we've got uh, Ole Miss at unranked Max fourth favorite team, Arkansas. So there's a lot of, of ranked versus unranked teams this weekend as we go into statement weekend. And two teams that need to make a massive statement. And we're going to start right there in Happy Valley with Ohio State and Penn State. We've got two teams here that desperately need to make a statement, even though – they're probably already in. 
but we talked about the numbers for both of these coaches, Mac. I know you think Penn State is the greatest thing since sliced bread at a certain shop that puts French fries and sandwiches in the Keystone State. Penn State is a fraud, and I hate that because I love Drew Aller. I believe in Drew Aller. All that stuff from earlier this season. Drew Aller's progressed fantastic. You've got the running game. You've got the tough Penn State football. This team struggled to be a garbage-ass USC team. Okay, on the road, whatever. They left early. They did everything. It's the James Franklin factor. Why are you so convinced that Penn State is that good? Well, listen, it's because they're going to cut the crust off the bread this week. That's why. You know, <laughs> if they're going to do it, this has got – I mean, how long can this go? I mean, how many times are you going to lose and have your season be ended by Ohio State? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten? They, they've got to Eleven. figure it out one way or another. But, I, I mean, I, again, look at it from this standpoint. I mean, I, we know Ohio State's good, but Ohio State's had the, kind of their struggles as well. And, and I knew they were going to struggle a little bit last week because there was no way, as I said, Nebraska was going to get embarrassed two weeks in a row. So you knew Nebraska was going to come out. But, listen, Ohio State's had some hiccups this year as well. And, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you what, if, if there's going to be a year that I think they could do it, is this the year? No, it's really not. I think Ohio State's really going to win this game. <laughs> you know what, TJ? The funny thing about this is, and, and we're all about credit. We're all about giving credit. And I can't remember exactly who said this, but it was on the CBS either pre- or halftime show last Saturday. And when you look at the difference in the Big Ten of the hierarchy of the Big Ten, which I'm going to say is Indiana, Ohio State, and Oregon. But there's Oregon, then there's Ohio State and Indiana this year. Oregon is playing loose and free. Here's our stuff. We're dropping it on the table. Like you've said, we're floating ducks down your rivers. We're breaking into your state. Here's our moxie. We don't give a shit. And Ohio State is playing under the same, let's call it what it is, under the same NIL dump trucks that they're afraid to lose. And that is not my word again. I can't remember who it was on the CBS pre- or halftime show on Saturday last weekend. But it's like Ohio State's playing scared, and Oregon's like, yo, <laughs> we told you we were coming, and here we are. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really easy. Um, one, you got to love what Dan Lanning is doing. I mean, he, he's got that team playing exactly how they want him to play. But two, did look, does Oregon did Oregon come in here and have the expectations as Ohio State has had? I'd probably have to say no. Like, I didn't expect Oregon to come. I, I thought Oregon would struggle this year. I really did. I thought this whole Dan Lanning thing and the Ducks and stuff, I thought that was a bunch of crap. But they're proving me wrong. Um, the pressure's always been on Ohio State. It always will be. Until somebody knocks them off consistently, it's always going to be on Ohio State. Ohio State's the team that hasn't won crap. And, you know, and let's just call it as it is. That's them. I just, you know, when I look at Penn State and, and I go past the – maybe I don't. Maybe they, here we're all here. You know, the first step in recovery is admitting the problem. I don't trust James Franklin. And he's giving me no reason to earlier Zero. this year against Illinois. Yeah. You know what? This is a game. I believe in this Penn state team. They got them. Nope. They didn't cover the spread. And it's not mm -hmm. about covering the spread. We're, we're talking about helmet to helmet contact here. It's not about covering the spread. USC is crap. We shit on LSU at the beginning of the year. And I know LSU choked one off at college station last weekend, but Let's think about what everybody said after that week one in Vegas, USC, LSU. Who in the hell would you rather put a bet on right now? It's mm -hmm. LSU and Garrett Nussmeyer. USC is a disaster. USC and Penn State, to me, are the same disaster. And all, that's, you know, the, hey, we lost because of the refs. TJ, you said it earlier. Mac, I know you've said this a bunch of times. What? No, you lost because you were two for 16 on third down. Mm -hmm. 
at, at some point it comes down to in Mac, hey, your early experience with Joe Missoula. At some point it comes down to you have to make the right call at the right time. You have to know how to manage a clock. Mm-hmm. And to me, sorry, I think he's a good guy. James Franklin can't do any of that shit. Well, I mean, all you have to, but, but just look at the past. Sorry, Mac, but just look at the past. You have eight years of data points to support your position. Eight years. Like, and so what makes you think he's going to do it? What makes you think he's going to do it tomorrow? But if I, I I just say, if I take the other side, it was the same thing you could be saying about Harbaugh at Michigan too, right? I mean, he struggled. I mean, he couldn't beat Ohio State. That was a long time in coming, and nobody thought that he was a bad coach, right? Everybody respected him. So, I mean, if you're Penn State, you got to look at this and say, you know, look what we got left to play this year. If we could somehow figure a way to get Ohio State, we got Washington, we got Purdue, we got Minnesota, and we got Maryland. I mean, th- this is this is an easy schedule for them the rest of the way if they can figure out how to get through Ohio State. I mean, so, I mean – and like you said, at some point he's got you got to figure it out. He's either going to do it or he can't. And if he can't, then maybe they need to find somebody else who can. But you know, I, I just kind of think of the same thing like Michigan and Harbaugh. I mean, at some point he had to get it, and once he got it, remember, once he beat him, he wasn't going to lose it. He didn't lose. No pick from Mac because this one will be up here later tonight on his preview specifically about the game. TJ, uh, I, I'm going with. Ohio State, call me a sissy on the money line. They are on the road. And I'm also going to play this game over 45 and a half because I think Ohio State's offense and the talent they have with the dual running backs and Ibuka and and freaking uh, Jeremiah Smith like and Will Howard, the dual threat, I think this game goes over because it gets loose and it gets loose on the bad side. The, the fumble for me... I'd have a lot more faith in Penn State to, hey, I'll just take Penn State or Ohio State on the money line. If it was at night under the lights, I would have a different theory. Ohio State would win the game maybe by a field goal. I got Ohio State on the money line, and I got the game over, and I think Ohio State's going to literally, this could be the game that gets James Franklin fired. I like Ohio State here too. Um, I but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna lay the three and a half just for fun. Um, look, I I think I think everything you said is correct. I think 105,000 people at night in white, screaming and carrying on at Beaver Stadium plays more to Penn State's advantage than 105,000 people at noon. Um, so I agree with you there. Um, Ohio State has won nine out of the last ten head to head. The only one that they that Penn State won won by three points, so there's one. There's all my there's the data points right. The, like they, Mac was right. Like Penn State, it, Penn State, Ohio State is very similar to Michigan, Ohio State. Like Penn State has to find a way, and I'm not convinced they're going to do it. No, I don't. I don't necessarily know if anybody is. And again, Mac will have his thoughts in a few hours. We're going to transition quickly, and I don't think this one's going to take a whole lot of conversation, at least not for me. Number one, Oregon visits the big house, and this is a noon thirty kick on the West Coast. They take on Michigan. This line is creeping. It's at about fifteen and a half. Don't know what it's going to go off exactly at by the time it goes tomorrow. Over under at forty five and a half. I don't think this is a game. This is nowhere near a game. Michigan's offense makes me want to never watch a football game ever again. I don't give a damn which one of the 72 quarterbacks you want to roll in there. Michigan's offense sucks. Oregon's defense is very underrated. I've got the Ducks to cover hell. I've got the Ducks to cover three touchdowns in the big house, and I've got this game probably over 45 and a half is where I'm going to lean. Because I think Oregon's going to put up a big number. Remember last week, Illinois was supposed to give them a tough game. And we saw how that one went. Mac, where are you at? I, I'm, Mike, I'm, I'm in your ship right there, baby. Oregon Black. all the way. This is not even, no, this is not even going to be a contest. Uh, the Ducks are going to cover this easily. This Michigan team, like you said, very one-dimensional on offense. Uh, I don't know what's worse, their running game or their passing game. Um, I, I know <laughs> um, 
yeah, I just I, I, I watched that game last week against Michigan State. There, there's no way they should have even have been in that game. Michigan State had plenty of opportunities to to take it to them. I mean, I'll give them credit. They did take advantage of some breaks, but uh, this is a Ducks win and, and an easy cover for them. Uh, the, the Ducks are the best team in the country. There's no doubt about that. And they're not going to be intimidated by playing in Michigan. They're going to roll. Deej, I'm pretty sure you're going to go on that. <laughs> He's already shaking his head. Deej. Nope, I'm going to swing and miss pass. Speaking of nope, another no, team. No, well, I'm oh, sorry, go Mike. Go ahead. Sorry, Mike. I think it's a clean sweep. Um, yeah, the only hope that Michigan has is they have three chances, slim, none, and fat. Um, they need to run the ball and shorten the game. If they're able to do that, they'll, then this might be close, question mark. Um, but I think Oregon blows. I think I'm taking, I'm playing the over on this game too. I think they put up a huge number. I think it's, it's one of those 40 to 10 jobs. The only time these two teams are close this weekend is when Oregon steps off their plane and they're that close to Michigan. And Mm -hmm. that's the end of it. Speaking of two other games that aren't going to be close or another game. That's not going to be close. We're going to go to the don't call it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party in Jacksonville for a couple more years before we go Tampa and Atlanta, whatever the hell Florida and Georgia, big game, huge game to me every year, but I'm going to say this chomping. Uh, I know Florida's looked better on the defensive side the last couple of weeks. They really have obviously the, uh, torn uh, ligament for Grant Mertz, Graham Mertz, as the Gators move on. DJ Lagway is in there. The Gator team, I'm telling you, they still can't play defense. They played inspired since the bye week. They've had a bye week leading into this one. If anybody is telling you that Florida is going to keep pace with Georgia in this game, they're not. You saw it when Georgia went into Austin and beat the Tar, don't care what the score is, they beat the Tar out of the Longhorns. This Georgia team is good. And this Gators team, I like where they're at with Lagway, and they've looked better. Well, let's call a spade a spade here. Georgia's favored by 17. This is another one I would alt line up to 20 and a half for Georgia on the minus side, over under 52 and a half. Again, same theory that I mentioned earlier. Georgia's probably looking at about a 40 to 47 spot here. I think you can get the Gators for a couple touchdowns. The dogs roll, Mac. Where we got? You know, one thing that Florida can do is they they can throw deep. Georgia struggled a little bit with the long passes. If they're going to take advantage of that Georgia defense, that's where they want to do it. I don't disagree with you on one point. I think Georgia wins this game. But listen, I, I know it's hard as a Gator fan you're looking at it a little bit differently from time to time. I, I, I don't think they've played all that bad. Against better teams, they've played pretty good. I think Georgia wins this game, but I'll tell you what. I'm going to take Florida in the points in this game. I think it's going to be closer than you think. Uh, I, again, I, I really think Florida's going to play a good game. Again, they're not going to win, but I think they'll cover. TJ, talk some sense into them. <laughs> You know what? Um, I like the way that Lagway's been playing as well. This would be a game that I might take Florida with the points in the first half. I think they keep it close. But uh, oh, once it gets to the third and fourth, I think Georgia walks away with it. I think this is a great play for the over. This game is going to be the world's largest outdoor cocktail massacre. Favorite game time. We're going to skip mine just for time purposes here. And we're going to start with Max favorite game. And a team that a lot of people have kind of forgotten about when we talk back to week one, the USC-LSU comparison, we left Clemson for dead. For dead. And Cole Klubnick is creeping his way up the Heisman board, the 11th-ranked Tigers. They host Louisville. Clemson minus 10.5, over under at 63. Mac, it is your favorite game. You take the floor, and then TJ can follow you. Because I got Clemson big. Absolutely. Like you said, a dud in week one, but since then, six consecutive wins, all double digit wins. They've really turned things around. Um, I I mean, every single game they've played so far has been a two score game for them. And so they haven't had to play a close game. Louisville is up and down. 
I mean, I don't know what to I don't know what to expect from this team. Um, against the top teams in the ACC, they're zero and three. Okay, they've lost the uh, they lost the SMU, they lost to Miami, and so you know if if we agree that Clemson's one of these top teams, is Louisville going to be able to rise to the occasion and beat them? I just don't think they are. As a matter of fact, I think Clemson wins this game pretty handily. Buttons are fantastic. TJ, <laughs> are you agreeance or not? I was I'm a just concerned say. if we go three straight clean sweeps here. <laughs> well, I could go against it if you wanted me to, but I agree. I, I've i been pretty impressed with how Clemson has come off the mat in the last several weeks. Um, I like them here as well. All right, next one, we've got your favorite game, TJ, and a team that I'm really growing to love a lot and watch them play a lot, Arizona State, the Sun Devils at Stillwater to take on one of our favorite coaches. One of the you got to wear the jersey. One one show for us, DJ. I, Oklahoma I will, State and Mike Gundy. I will dig that thing out for next week or <laughs> the next time I'm here for sure. Um, look, I'm in love with looking this. at a field goal here. This is an interesting game, and we all know about Cam Scadaboo. That's our guy. That's our guy, man. He's the burrito express master. Um, look, I'm a big fan of what Dillingham's putting together. And I may be one of those people that's just, you know, taking the Del Taco double Del cheeseburger and running with it here. But um, look, this team is so much fun to watch. I love watching Cam run the ball. He runs just like with a purpose. And I love, I love watching that defense isn't too bad either um now arizona state's favored by three here and you're like well why would you pick a game that features a ninth team in the big 12 and the last place team in the big 12 this is a point where this is a game and i'm going to play the over on this as well it's at 58 and a half which is a little bit on the higher side but um look this this is going to be a shootout oklahoma state needs to win this game to prove that like they're not a joke even though they're 16th in the Big 12. Meanwhile, Arizona State has a ton to play for because if they win, then they're bowl eligible. And that's that's a huge thing, especially for a second year coach and especially for where this team was last year. So um I'm gonna I love ASU in this game. I think they win this game. I think they cover the three. This is like for me, it's a 38-31 game. Um, but I'm also playing the over really hard here. Mac, there's a lot of maroon in this house, let me tell you that. There's a lot of maroon. Um, Mike's commander's the maroon. Man's coming back this week. No, the not furniture. That. No, no, no. The furniture I'm man. I'm just saying. Um, the furniture man, Sam Levitt. Come on, the quarterback, right? He's coming back this week. You know. He if is. You know, you know. The furniture guy, Sam. Yeah, Levitt. I know. All I right, just... he's coming back. It's not going to make it. <laughs> it's not. Gonna... Listen, one thing ASU doesn't do well is play on the road they do not play well on the road um i'm a little concerned about this one i i really am not only do they not play well on the road they don't do a good job against the run and oklahoma state has a pretty good running back yeah he's had probably i think maybe the maybe, do they could you say maybe the most disappointing season so far i know but Fair. at some point he's gonna break through i mean you just know ollie gordon is gonna have a big game at some point this year it might be this week. ASU is not a good run-stopping defense. I, I mean, and again, they I don't think they play great on the road. Levitt's coming back, you know, from injury. How healthy is he? That's the other thing we have to worry about. You know, how long is he going to be able to go? Is he ready to go? They didn't look great against Cincinnati. For me, I, I think this is a tough one for ASU. I think Oklahoma State wins this game. I agree with you with the Cincinnati part, but I, I think Oklahoma State is just a notch below the Devils right now. I, yeah, and well, I hope to, so. to reiterate your point, Mac, the Devils one and two on the road, four and zero at home. They've got this game against Oklahoma State, and then they've got UCF. Which, trust me, we had talked about frauds earlier with Penn State. UCF just like their national championship frauds. Then the Arizona State goes to Kansas State. Then they get the best team in the Big 12. Well, one and one A. BYU. Iowa State, BYU. And then, of course, the game with Arizona. So it is a big mark here. Uh, and I, I, yeah, all of us, like, of course, what 
for the people that don't know enough about Arizona State football to know where the program was, to have seen them last year, as we've all mentioned with Kenny Dillingham, and to see them this year with Kenny Dillingham, no matter what happens from this point forward, they're going bowling. We know that. Where they finish in the Big 12, that remains to be seen. They've got a tough stretch here. But Kenny Dillingham, from where they were the year before him to his first year to now, I'm telling you right now, in this conference, Arizona State's going to be a force going forward. And if anybody Mm -hmm. doesn't agree with that, mark this, bookmark this, send it to your friends. Come at us in our direct messages if they suck next year. I'm telling you. The trajectory of this program is like a freaking moon rocket right now. And it's Kenny doing him and the culture he's created. Yeah, and Kenny himself is – yeah, I mean, Kenny himself, I was going to say, is must-see TV. I mean, I I, like you said, we have a lot of maroon in this house, and and, and I love ASU. I I just know they've really just struggled on the road. And and for me, this just seems like a tough matchup for them. Yeah, absolutely. And let's move on to the NFL side of things to uh, get us ready for another big weekend in the National Football League. We talked about replay. We talked about a lot of that stuff. We get a break from international games. And let me be the first one on behalf of the Mike Arana show to apologize to Germany for sending you the Panthers and the Giants. I, I can't express our nation's concerns enough. Really sorry that that's the game we've we've given you, but we have a break a week before that. So biggest game on the schedule to me, boys, and I think you'll agree, we've talked about this, the NFC North being possibly the best division in football. I'm already past the point where it is the best division in football. Yeah, Bears, I know you had a rough weekend last weekend. I like where you're headed there too. But Packers, Lions, obviously the Jordan Love situation, something to monitor. The Lions are on one hell of a roll right now. And, Mackie, I think you even said this earlier today when we were talking. It seems like the Lions have triggered something. And I'm not going to take your words here, but when you watch how the Lions are playing games, there's been five different players on the Lions this year that have thrown passes. And you hit this on the head earlier, Mac. What are we seeing from this Detroit Lions team? And to bow down, like all Barry Bond style, want you to pick them to go to the Super Bowl. And right now at the midway point, I can't argue you guys, but what did you see specifically from the Lions, from your Lions, Vegas men? Yeah, I mean, like I said, they're on like it's a revenge tour every single week. It's like they're, they're just – they're mad about everybody. They just got this, oh, man, like – I'm I, I'm mad at you because of your uniform. I'm mad at you because of this. It you know we lose our our best defender. It, you know it it just doesn't matter. Uh, the, it's just a danger. I mean this team is scoring. I I mean like you wouldn't believe it's 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 kind of like a, a video game that we're watching with these guys. It's like you know you you look it's it's like the other last week against Tennessee was like 14, 14. You turn back the other way and it's like 34, 14, 40 to 14, 50 to 14. They, they just don't stop. And, and, and coach Campbell just doesn't care. This team has one goal, one goal, and that's to win a Super Bowl. And they're, they're playing like it. You talk about uh, Oregon and the ducks, like playing kind of that free willy nilly. Like I just don't get that. That's how the lions are right now. They don't care. Our place, your place, you want to meet in the alleyway. I don't care where you want to meet us. We're taking you down, and we're not going to stop. The gas pedal is going to be there from the first quarter to the fourth quarter, and and probably in the post game as well. It ain't stopping. This is a machine right now. Yeah, and TJ, I you know I know you and I had this conversation about the Lions and and their place and. You know, Mac, you just alluded to it. I mean, we're talking, you know, obviously the big news with the Vikings within the division is the injury to Derisaw. They've already replaced him. But, again, continuity on the line, whether you bring in another Pro Bowl or not. But with this Lions team, it's just like, like, I know Dan Campbell hasn't actually said it in a press conference. It probably doesn't look right to say in a press conference, but Dan Campbell doesn't give up. And that's why you see him on Applebee's commercials and Mm – Tell them your order. 
You know, they're going to see it coming. <laughs> like, he, it's like, I feel that, TJ, like, I feel like Dan Campbell sat there after they lost the NFC title game and he heard all the chirping and mm-hmm. he didn't have to go into a darker, darkness retreat like some people. He probably just sat down at an Applebee's, smashed a bunch of Brutuses and a bunch of boneless wings and said, fuck it, I got it. We beat the Niners. We're going to do it next year. Like, that's Dan Campbell, man. Oh, yeah, 100%. He probably mixed in some riblets too. But, yeah, th- like, th- look, this is this is such a fun team to watch. They're playing th- – they're 6-1, and one, and, yeah, they made it to the as far as they did last year. But, like, you look back at the history of the Lions, like – they've always been kind of like that team where, yeah, we're kind of fun to watch and Thanksgiving's kind of fun, but in the end, we're just going to go five and 11 and that's going to be that, but we're going to have some, right. from some glimpses of glory here. He's, he's pushing all the right buttons, man. And, and these, these video game scores are just comical, like 42, 47, they scored 31 against what was the best team, arguably the best team in the NFC at the time and beat the Vikings. 52 they scored like three different ways like holy smokes this team is so much fun and i just love watching it and it's and and you know what when that golf for stafford trade was made everybody thought that the rams got the better of that deal because golf was just kind of this yeah he led the rams to the super bowl but that team was kind of a mess and they didn't really put up much of a fight and here we're getting matt stafford who just needs a a change of scenery and some good players well i think the lions are proving that they've gotten the better of that deal with jared goff because he has been amazing he has been so fun to watch this off and campbell has built this offense around him and it shows and i'm loving every minute of it yeah absolutely and like i said on in in mike's man crush the other day before we get to our picks here last four weeks 23 touchdowns for the lions 13 incompletions over that same stretch for Jared Goff. The Lions have Houston next week on a Sunday night football game. And then they've got Jacksonville. They got Indy. They got Chicago, Green Bay, Buffalo, Chicago. They've got the the late ass Monday night football game against San Francisco, which is interesting because it's on the road. It's late. Second to last week of the season. Niners are going to get people back. That could be a really big game in the grand scheme of things but right now i think you got to look at it as lions have home field advantage i don't know if you're going to beat them there so as far as this game goes minus three and a half and over under 48 and a half i'm going over and i've got the lions to cover on the road or not like as whether jordan love plays or not which doesn't look likely i got the lions to cover and i got the game over because it ain't the middle of december in green bay Weather is not a factor yet. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if Love plays, I don't think it's going to make a difference. He, he did not look good last week. I mean, he was really, really hobbled. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you on this one 100%, Mike. I, you give away three, give away 10, give away 13, you can probably even give away more than that. I don't think this one's going to be close. I really think the, the, the Packers are, are just – I mean, their last couple of weeks, their wins have been close. I mean, win's a win. We'll take it. But they haven't seen anything like the Lions. Yeah, I've got this game going over. This is a, this is a great overplay. I love this. Um, and but I, I want to give I want to give the Packers some flowers too. This team is is been very impressive. I didn't think Jordan Love was going to have nearly the level of success that he's been having lately. Um, I think this is great to watch. And even when he hasn't played and Malik Willis has been in there, like, it's just like, it's almost like next man up, next man up. And and so um, I'm really impressed. I love the Packers receiving court. They're young, they're talented, they're raw. And I just love, I, I love watching. This is going to be a great matchup, but yeah, oh, the play on this game is definitely the over. All right. Next game that we've got on the target slate Cowboys at Falcons. Cowboys coming off of the loss in San Francisco, which seems like a regular annual occurrence. And the Falcons coming off of the big win over the Buccaneers. Home game, Atlanta favored by two and a half, over under 51 and a half. I think the biggest thing when you want to talk about the Falcons, I've got the Falcons cover. I am going to play this game over as well, inside on the turf. 
the biggest thing I think I've seen in, in anything I'm watching with the Falcons is Kirk Cousins is throwing and planting off of both feet. Not all the time yet, but you can tell now that we're at this point in the season, he's getting more comfortable with it. They're utilizing those weapons. Kyle Pitts, I love you. Go Gators, chomp, chomp. Carry the ball all the way through next time, please. I've got the Falcons to cover, and I've got the over in this one. Mac? I mean, let's start with the with the Cowboys. I mean, where do we go with this with this team? I mean, Dak looks good for a quarter or two, and then, but you you know, here's what here's you want to know something you want to count on. You're going to count on one, two interceptions. You know he's going to throw them. That's what he does. That's that's Dak. He's going to throw those interceptions no matter what. Um, it's kind of interesting to me that this, the games that the Cowboys have played against teams that are kind of playoff fight teams. They've really, really struggled against. And Atlanta, you could probably put them in that category. And not just that, the Cowboys, after Atlanta, they have Philadelphia, Houston, and Washington. I wonder if the Cowboys are going to win another game in the next four weeks. I just don't know. And what's that going to do to Jerry Land? I mean, let's just be honest. You, you know there's just got to be so much pressure on that Fire team. the fucking GM. That's the problem in <laughs> Dallas. I mean, do we? Why are we sugarcoating shit over there anymore? That's the problem. Sorry, but, I just. Yeah, but I'll, I mean, I'll, you, you I'll know, see man. myself out first. I mean, I, I just I, I watch this Cowboys team. Like you said, it's to me. I mean, for a quarter or two, they look all right, and then you know they get a turnover, and they're just so inconsistent. It's just, let's just like you said, it's not a good team. It's it's not a good team. It's not a playoff team. This is a team that. You know, they, they need to kind of take a look and, and, and kind of see what their future really, truly is. Because I'm going to be honest, I don't I, I know they gave all this money to Dak. I, I don't think I don't think that's their future. I, I think this team is in a lot of trouble. I referred to it last week. I said they're the Titanic. You know, they look good on the outside, but they're just taking in water. And this is a sinking ship. I think you meant to call them Anna Kornikova because they look great and never win. Um, look, I said at the beginning of the season, I said at the beginning of the season that I thought that the, the Cowboys were going to make a run this year. I didn't think they were going to go to the Super Bowl. I thought they were going to make a run. This has been an incredibly disappointing season. They can't run the ball for crap, um, and that automatically makes them one-dimensional when the gun goes off to start. Brock Purdy uh, they're just one-dimensional. The Cowboys. Last Sunday night was all you need to know. Dolphins and Bills, if you saw the Power Pyramid on Wednesday night, congratulations, Buffalo. I, I came on hot and heavy. I I used ranch with my wings. I know what kind of sin that is in Buffalo. You've won the East. That entire division is ass. If you saw my preview on the triple option for Thursday, we can, we can just – Flip freaking cards everywhere we go with the Jets. Hey, maybe that'll work. None of it works. Like the division's ass. Buffalo won. Now you got Miami. And I said this last week too. Tua came back and much to the crowd's light. And I'm sure his family's delight took a couple of slides. The Cardinals are not a bad football team. I think that's the other thing that people aren't understanding here. The Cardinals haven't given up a sack in three games. That hasn't happened in decades. So we knew that there was going to be a point with the Cardinals that they were going to start to turn the corner and be tough regardless. We're there. With the Dolphins, we knew we were going to have to adjust to Tua coming back. Now we've got Dolphins and Bills. This is in Buffalo. I don't care what the stats are about Miami and Buffalo. Blah, 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 blah. It's also November, the first weekend in November. I can't go forward to Sunday. I can't do those kind of one, two, three numbers. I think Buffalo is on a run here. And I think the most impressive thing, TJ, I'll start with you on this one. I think the most impressive thing with Buffalo is how great Keon Coleman and Josh Allen are getting on the same page because that's a whole nother level while they're working Coop into the mix. Oh, 100%. Look, we we probably thought that when Stefan Diggs went to Houston, that this was – that that and – and when they lost um, uh, Davis to Jacksonville, they thought this 
this is going to be a garbage receiving core and they're just going to have to rely on running the football. And Keon Coleman's played fantastic. He's he's gotten into his own here and the chemistry between him and and Josh are is is unreal. Um this is good this is an exciting game for me. Um I was pretty impressed with what Tua did last week as well and I I think he needed to get in there and take a couple of shots and yeah, he's going to have to change his game up a little bit, but um I'm not willing to write the Dolphins off just yet. I think they cover the six in this game, but that's just me. I'm going to uh, put a little cayenne pepper in my water, get a little bit younger. Hold on a second. If I knew one of the three of us was going down (laughs) that joke road, I would have bet a million (laughs) dollars at one-to-one odds it was going to be you. Oh, it was going to be one of the so three much, of us. I feel so much younger. Do you? Do you feel healthier? We're talking about the Bills oh, man, and Dolphins. So Leave better. Aaron Rodgers yeah. alone. Woo! Leave Aaron alone. <laughs> Bills, Dolphins. Also your favorite game of the week. So where are you at with this one? I already well, gave up. You your know, Bills you, won the division. Yeah. No, but I, I picked this one because, uh, honestly, what you said a couple weeks ago, you, you kind of dropped – the Tua bomb, and you said, listen, when they come back, they're going to win this division. That's what you said. Well, first, after after the Jets, you know, you, you kind of got off that. But it, so it, was really, it was really intriguing to me. I I, I kind of I, – I watched him last week. He looked pretty good. I mean, I'm scared to death watching him play. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm trying to – I'm going to be very serious. I'm, I'm really, really scared – watching him play. I, I don't, I don't want him to get hurt. You know, every time he runs out of the pocket, I'm it's, 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 I, I kind of cringe a little bit. I, I really do. I hope for his sake that he, he stays healthy. I mean, he's, he's a difference maker. He really, really is. But it, there is a part of me that, you know, I, I really, I really worry about, you know, what could happen to him. But that being said, you know, he had a really good week. Do I think they can go into Buffalo in this game? No, I really don't. But I, I think it makes for an intriguing rest of the season. I've got the Bills to cover the spread here. I I think Miami is one of the teams in the East that can make a run and get one of those last playoff spots. I think once that starts to get their continuity back on offense, but – I just I think this Buffalo team is playing damn good football right now, and I wouldn't bet against them. I'm going to go to my favorite game, and we're going to go up to the PNW. You're going to hear this. I'm telling you, you've already heard it so far this week. You're going to keep hearing it. You're going to hear it all the way through Sunday morning, last-minute people going, hey, did you know that the Rams have beaten the Seahawks so many times in a row? Hey, breaking news flash, guys. Did you know that the guy that was the coach of the Seahawks when the Rams kept beating the Seahawks isn't the coach of the Seahawks anymore? It's my favorite game because there's been a couple of years in the, in the past couple of years here where we've we've looked at it with San Francisco and Seattle at the top of the West and been like, oh, the NFC West could be one of the best, if not the best division in football. I don't think any of us would agree right now. The two North divisions are probably the two best divisions in football. But – a couple of years ago, just with the strength of the Niners and the Seahawks, that was what people were saying. here. Well, this year, when we break it down and we look at the NFC West, it's a log jam from top to bottom. We know San Francisco's story. They're on a bye this week. The Rams have had the Seahawks number over the past couple of years. I came out on the Sunday spread last week and I said, you know, you saw what Seattle was capable of when they beat the hell out of Atlanta. And they never showed up against Buffalo. They did in the first half. They were inside the four-yard line twice and got nothing out of it. I saw a little bit of frustration, and let's call a spade a spade. You take DK Metcalf off the field. You got the guy that takes the top off of the defense, stretches the defense. Call whatever cliche you want to say from a technical standpoint. When DK Metcalf is on the field, the Seahawks are a better team. This is also Mike McDonald's Seahawks, not Pete Carroll's Seahawks. The Seahawks looked like crap last week at home against a good Buffalo team. The Rams are starting to get people healthy, high fly and win, extra rest. I like this Seahawks team off of last week's performance 
and off of a still getting healthy Rams team at home here. If you wait too long, it's still as of today, Friday morning. I got the Seahawks at plus 102 at home. It, it's that kind of game. But this is a massive game in the NFC West with the way everything's going. I got the Seahawks. Mac, where are you at? I really like this Rams team. I know defensively they're not real good. Um, they, 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 you know, they're they're coming in three and four. I mean, they've had one of the toughest schedules so far this year. Um, but I just like the way the Rams offensively. I, I just think, I think they're going to be too much for Seattle. Seattle's really kind of struggled. They started off the season really good. Their last three or four games, they have not played well. Um, even at home, they haven't played well. I think Seattle can take advantage of the Rams' defense. I can see actually a lot of points be scored in this game, but I think that's where the Rams are going to have the advantage. I think the Rams just outscore Seattle in this game. Yeah, and TJ, before you jump on that, like for the people that don't know, if the season ended today, the Arizona Cardinals would be the playoff team out of the West. So we're talking massive implications here with the Rams being at three and four. Where do you sit on this one? For the record, I like nothing about the Rams, period, end of story. Um, but besides that, um, look, you guys both made great points, but I think this, I think that the Rams time has come and gone. I think this is a team that's going to struggle to put up points against Seattle. Um, this team is uh, basically like they, they lost. Yeah. They beat Minnesota. Minnesota is kind of on a downswing. They beat the Raiders, but any, we can get 11 guys from the neighborhood and beat the Raiders. So that's not a big deal. Um, I don't really like the way this team has been playing. Um, Seattle is also like, uh, Seattle is so frustrating to me right now. They go into Atlanta and basically blow them out. And then they come home and just lay a ginormous egg against the bills. And so Seattle is so up and down as well. Um, so it's kind of, for me, the battle of who I don't really care for. Who's like, who's playing the worst. Right? Uh, I like Seattle here. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes that's all, that's all it takes. And, and, that it's my favorite game. Obviously, I have a little bit of a slight lean to the NFC West because of where I grew For up sure. and, and my team. But like this NFC West is interesting because there's two sides to the 49er argument about it. Is they're getting everybody ready and coming back? Maybe, possibly. Christian McCaffrey plays against the Bucks the week after next week, this week, which is next week. Good effing God. He comes back against the Bucks, and then you've got the situations with Dre Greenlaw, with Jawan Jennings, you know, the nines. But that Seahawk team can go into Atlanta and smash the Falcons. They can come home. Oh, it wasn't close. Smashed. Yeah, and they could come home and get smashed by the Bills. I think that's what makes the NFC West such a crazy thing. I do agree. I think out of the four teams in the West, that the Rams are the ones that, yes, we're on the up and up a little bit here, but let's be honest, we know the crash down of having to rebuild is here. We might be able to prolong it for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. The Cardinals are the wild card in it. The Niners should still win the division, assuming things go right. But I think it's compelling, even though the record doesn't really tell you that. TJ, your favorite game, we stick with a team on the West. And I'm wearing this because it's purple for the Ravens. No, I'm not. Listen, the reason, Ravens fans, if you didn't see the Power Pyramid on Wednesday before I let TJ talk about his favorite game, here's the thing. You guys were all over us, all through our DMs, about how Quote, we have the best running attack in the history of the league. I spit out a damn water when I read that comment. Then on top of that, because we've won five in a row. Get your mouse out of your pocket. As I said on Wednesday, sorry you couldn't play Deshaun Watson's Cleveland Browns. The reason I had the Ravens where I did in the power pyramid. You laid a turd at home to the Raiders. To the freaking Raiders. To the Raiders. Whatever. You laid that one. Baltimore has the worst passing defense in the league. 
And here's the here's the really crazy stat on top of the fact that they've lost eight times when they've had the lead in their last 42 inside of two minutes. This one comes from Jamison Hensley of ESPN. This is not a stat you want to lead anybody in. The Ravens also lead the league in dropped interceptions. Some of you Raven fans are going to call me a hater. No, I'm not a hater. The reason you were there is because the guy who was coaching your defense last year that you didn't think was as good as he was is now coaching the Seahawks. You have the worst passing defense in the league. Do you have the best rushing attack? That's not debatable. Do you have the greatest rushing attack in league history? Calm the hell down. This is an interesting game because Denver's defense is damn good on both sides, running and passing, TJ. Baltimore's passing defense, why I had them where I did in the power pyramid, sucks. But then there's Bonix progressing. It's your favorite game. Run with it. Yeah, this is a huge litmus test for the Denver Broncos here going going to uh, Baltimore to play this game. Um, look, we all know about the Baltimore Ravens historically, but yes, you nailed everything about it. Their defense this year against the pass has been not great. And I like what Bo Nix is doing. Um, I put him right up there with Jane Daniels. In fact, I think Bo Nix could win the rookie of the year in this league because of how he, how his progression, um, he, he's winning ball games and this defense is, is helping him out. Yes. But he's not, Bo Nix isn't losing games. Right. And he, and so he's not like the cause. Right. So um, I really like this game. I'm jumping on Denver on this. I'm getting nine. I'm taking that and I'm running because I think to be honest with you, I might even play them on the money line on the side because I think they can go into Baltimore and win this game. Remember when you two thought it was crazy when I said ultimately at the end of this, I thought Bo Nix was the best quarterback in this draft. Now, I will revisit that statement and say that I don't think he's the best quarterback in this draft from the transition to the pros. He could be. I mean, way crazy in the whatever, what are you smoking Mike kind of category? Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix. I know they're not in the same conference, but you could be talking about like a Mahomes, Allen, you know, Allen and Jackson. Like, mm. I think those two, if they got a chance to face each other on a regular basis, I think those two are the best quarterbacks. I think Caleb Williams can be in that mix. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels. Now we're getting somewhere. But I, 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 I've I, believed in Bo Nix. People are going to call me an Oregon homer because of what I'm saying about Oregon this year, Mac. But, like, Bo Nix is a good quarterback. Dylan Gabriel is a good quarterback. Sometimes, and I know, Mac, you are the biggest proponent of the waiting time and not playing quarterbacks right away. Like, I think Bo Nix is, is going to get there. Remember, we're still, and you know this as a Steeler fan, and it's a benefit to you as a Steeler fan. The Broncos said, how much money can we give you, Russ, to get the hell out of here? Your offense, your, and now I'm being like a Raven fan, the Steelers offense, the team that you are a fan of, is better with Russell Wilson, at least it appears in the first two games. Bo Nix is dealing with the residuals of Russell Wilson not being there, which means we're not going to have a ton of top-tier skill players to pair with you. I mean, the fact that TJ is going possible sprinkle money line, I know this is a tricky game for you, Mac. Where do you sit on this one? Well, I, I agree. I mean, Bo Nix, I mean, again, we're just a few games into his career. Uh, but if you look, he's he's really doing a good job. This is like a, a Sean Payton special game, right? I mean, you know he's going to have something cooked up for this. My only concern is this, and it's not so much that it's really being played in Baltimore. It's just teams that don't play against Lamar – on a regular basis, don't really do well. That's the thing. And they always say that you just can't uh, you can't go and practice and, and do the things that Lamar can do. You, in the division, you, you look, the, you know, the Browns, the Steelers, and the Bengals do a pretty good job because uh, they're used to playing against him. But the teams that don't play him kind of struggle a little bit. That's my main concern. 
I mean, but you want to talk about – first, let's talk about Denver for just a second. A team that's completely – I mean, you want to talk about undercover and, and just getting stuff done. I talked to a friend today who's a huge Broncos fan. He's so excited about this team. Uh, a little bit still uh, optimistic that, you know, they can make the playoffs. That's where he's thinking. But he knows they have some growing to do. Do I think they can go into Baltimore and beat Lamar? I, I, I don't think so. I, I think Baltimore is just a little bit better than them. And like I said, not playing against Lamar, I, I think that's um, a little bit of a tough one. But like I said, I, I wouldn't put it against them, but I, I would be surprised if they won this game. But I, I think they can keep it close. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and you know what, TJ, doggone it, people like you. You and I have talked each other into plenty of bets. You know what? Broncos on the money line. Speaking of betting, let's get into our best bets for the weekend. And, TJ, I am going to start with you this time. What's your best bet of the weekend? It's uh, two legs on Sunday. I've got the Bears Cardinals over 44 and a half and the Colts Vikings over 46 and a half. Um, the reason why I like these, number one, they're both indoors. So that is a huge thing for me. I really look at the environment here. Um, I love when teams play indoors. I think it's great for great for offense. It's great for overs. Um, number two, I love the fact that Joe Flacco is starting over Anthony Richardson. I think that makes Indianapolis a better team. This team is going to put up points. And there's no pressure on Flacco. Flacco is not even the guy. Like, right. So this is a great spot for him to have a huge game. Um, yeah, that's my pick is the two overs. And you know how I love my overs. The master of overs is TJ and a little different this week because of the way they set it up. Obviously we don't have a world series game Saturday night, tomorrow night, but like we also, the latest damn kickoff we have on Saturday is five o'clock the night we get an extra hour of sleep. Well done. Bravo. My best bet, I'm going to, it's two legs also. I already talked about both of these teams, but I like the Seahawks because of what happened last week. And I don't think this Rams team is as good as they looked last week. I know they're getting guys back, but let's be honest. I love, I love Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, but both of the guys have a hard time getting healthy and staying healthy especially when they come back, like mind blown last week, Nakua's usage when we heard that it was a maybe thing. I mean, maybe some Joel and bead nonsense going on there, but I digress. I like Seattle to bounce back from where they were because dominated Atlanta looked like ass at home, <laughs> but they looked like ass at home against in the power pyramid, the third best team in the league, the bills on the other side, the Oregon thing, no, it's not because I feel so connected to my January prediction of Oregon to win the national title. Remember, in that same video that we've referenced a bunch of times, I said Oregon wins next year's national title and multiples after that. I think Oregon, and we've talked about the inflatables, we talked about it earlier. I think Oregon's just that damn good. And I think the amazing thing about it is I don't think anybody, because you don't think about great defense at Oregon. You don't think about horrible defenses. The Oregon defense is really damn good. And if you haven't watched them yet, your eyesight and your health is better for it. The Michigan offense is really damn bad. So I'm taking the Ducks to cover the 15. A little Northwest vibe on this, I guess, unintentionally. Seahawks on the money line. $100 bet there gets you 381 81 because you're about a plus 281, depending on when you get it. Mac, do you have a favorite bet of the weekend since baseball season is done? We will talk about the Yankees. I'm sorry, I was choking. We'll talk <laughs> about what court. happened in game five in the Bronx later. We have no World did, Series. Football weekend, did, favorite bet. Did the Dodgers sign Soto yet? I'm just joking. It's only it's only been about 48 hours. I'm I, pretty sure I just, Juan is hanging out with uh, Francisco Lindor, <laughs> and they're looking at property together. Spoiler alert. 
All right. I think you guys probably think I'm going to go to the Arkansas game, but I'm not going to the Arkansas game. He's going to pick Penn State. Trust me. Shit, and I'm gonna the Pitt Panthers. Jesus, are playing we go. SMU. And the Panthers are getting seven and a half, seven and a half points. Talk but you love the Mustangs. Respect. You love the Mustangs. I know. I don't <laughs> care. I don't care. Oh, my goodness. Listen, you're going to give me an undefeated Pittsburgh Panthers team who have the best uniforms in college football, seven and a half points. Bam, there you go. Barely undefeated. That's your best bet of the week. And you're going <laughs> to reside your whole weekend on the Pitt Panthers. <laughs> Come on. You your know, wife is you, a saint. And I like, you saw that actually, coming. Your wife is a saint. She actually is. But, like, she's really a saint that your best bet for the weekend is the Pitt Panthers. <laughs> Why would you put your family through that, man? Because uh, Arkansas has made me sad the last couple okay. of weeks. Okay, all right, here we go. <laughs> I think Max had a little too much of the Halloween candy from the last night, as I'm sure everybody Too did. much I, cayenne pepper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too much Reese's cayenne peanut, pepper. Reese's peanut butter I'm cups and cayenne now. effing pepper. <laughs> My God, we need a train conductor on this show because this is just where it gets. And oh, by the way, we got basketball now. We've got hockey now. We've got baseball winter meetings soon. I mean, it just doesn't stop. This is an incredible time. And for both of my way better looking than me colleagues, Vegas Mac, TJ, I encourage everybody, hey, on Tuesday night, take a, take a breath. Be patient. Let things unfold where they may. And we can overcome all of this together on Tuesday, November 5th, when the college football rankings come out for the first time. For TJ, for Vegas Mac, I'm Mike. We're out. <laughs>